Hello class, this is Ms. Augustine, and we are still in Chapter 1, and so this is going to be Chapter 1, Part 2. And we're going to begin by talking about something that you probably learned about at the junior high, and that is the scientific method. And chemists use the scientific method when we study just about anything in chemistry. And there are four main steps to the scientific method, and you can remember them using the acronym OHEC, but more about that in a little bit. So for starters, when you're um, using the scientific method, you'll observe something, and the observation comes with your senses. So you observe something, and that leads you to making a hypothesis, a so-called educated guess. And that educated guess is typically a testable statement. And that leads to experiments. So you observe something with your senses, you test it based upon an educated guess, um, and you run some experiments. And then your experiments will eventually lead to some sort of conclusion. So for instance, if your first experiment does not support the hypothesis, you'll do a different experiment. And after many experiments comes something we call a theory, which is a broad explanation. So your conclusion part of the scientific method is after all of your experimental results are studied, you end up with a theory. So I said that a way to remember the scientific method is using the acronym OHEC, where O equals observation, H is hypothesis, E is experimentation, and C is conclusions. So an example would be if I walked into my living room one night and flipped on the switch to turn on the light and nothing happened. In my senses, I observed, oh, the light didn't turn on and I'm going to make an educated guess. I guess the light bulb burned out. So now that is a testable statement. I can check it. I can experiment by switching the light bulb. I change the light bulb and I go back and flip the switch. Nothing, nothing happens. So now I observe that it was not the light bulb, but there's still no light on in the room. I'm going to make a second hypothesis. Perhaps the lamp isn't plugged in. So I crawl around on the floor and check, nope, the lamp is plugged in. So my experiment was, was the lamp plugged in? The lamp was plugged in. That leads me back to making my observation, the light's still not on, and my hypothesis, maybe the power is off in this room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go next door and see, no, lights are on in the next room, maybe the circuit was tripped in the room that I'm in, the living room. So I go to my circuit breakers and I look and sure enough the circuit had popped in the living room. So I flip the switch back over, go back into the living room, I test it, I turn on the light, and the light comes on. So finally my experiment yields an answer to what I observed with my senses. And if I continue that in many more rooms of the house when the circuit breaker is popped, the lights don't come on or the washing machine doesn't work or whatever, and that would lead to my broad conclusion or theory, lights and electric appliances do not work unless there is electricity running through the circuit. So that's an example of the scientific method. So that leads us to something called a scientific law. A scientific law is a concise statement that summarizes the results of many experiments. It's different than a theory because a scientific law is just stating what the results will always be. An example, and we'll learn a bunch of scientific laws this year, an example would be the law of conservation of matter. And it states that matter is neither created nor destroyed. It is always conserved. So what that tells me is, as a scientific law, is no matter how many experiments I run, I can always, for instance, account for all of the matter. And again, we'll talk much more about scientific laws as we move through the year. 
So the next thing we do is we talk about how chemistry is involved far and wide. So we're talking about how chemistry is involved <coughs> in the world. And I would ask you to name some aspect of life that didn't involve chemistry or name some aspects of life that do involve chemistry. And the answer here is that chemistry is involved in virtually every aspect of our lives. And that's because we are made up of elements and elements are what we study in chemistry. So chemistry is pretty much involved in just about every aspect of our lives. So let's look at the different aspects of our lives where chemistry is involved. So material science. We talk about the history of material science. And 3,000 years ago, iron was first first extracted from iron ore. And then sometime later, about 500 BC, steel was invented. And then later on, things like brass and bronze, these are alloys, mixtures of metals, and eventually ceramics. Then came the age of plastics. And that was uh, plastics being made of polymers, where polymers consist of many units. And so plastics are very large molecules and they're used for many different purposes and you learned about polymers last year in biology class when you talked about a monosaccharide which is one unit versus a polysaccharide which has many sugar units so again the age of plastics and the advent of us using plastics in so many aspects of our lives um, is part of chemistry then we can talk about chemicals and energy. And chemistry plays a very essential role in conserving energy and producing energy. So when we think about things like solar and wind power, when we think about sodium lamps, when we think about efficient light bulbs, um, LED bulbs, and when we think about hybrid cars, all of those things involve chemistry and the production and conservation of energy. Then we talk about the production of energy from things like photosynthesis, our plant friends, and then we can talk about fossil fuels, petrochemicals, and then we talk about production of batteries. All of these things are involved um, in the use of chemistry. And then we can talk about how chemistry uh, plays a role in medicines and biotechnology. We talk about the production of new medicines, vaccines, antibiotics, antivirals, all of those things um, are biochemists working with organic chemists and analytical chemists. And then the production of prosthetic and synthetic body parts, whether it's a prosthetic limb or a hip replacement or a knee replacement, all of those things involve material science and chemistry. And things like CRISPR, where people are doing gene therapy and genetically modified organisms, all of those things um, are chemistry. And then we talk about agricultural chemistry, so the production of insecticides and herbicides. People are looking for things that will make plants resistant to, for instance, the spotted lanternfly or insecticides that can be used to get rid of those insects without harming the plants or the humans. The development of tougher and more productive plants that are disease resistant or that travel better from the farm to the grocery store. All of those things involve chemistry and biochemistry. And then we can talk about chemistry and in the environment. Um, so factories give off and cars give off smog that is pollution. Um, those smog molecules results in problems with our atmosphere, ozone depletion, the hole in the ozone layer, and those things can also lead to acid rain. The smog combines with water in the air causing acid rain, and all of those things can lead to climate change. So all of these things are aspects of chemistry that different chemical workers in different fields are studying to improve our lives. So for now, this is Ms. Augustine. We have pretty much covered everything that's in chapter one for now. So this is Ms. Augustine signing off.